I'm not always a good person. I don't seem to have any special skills. I didn't graduate at the top of my class. I haven't traveled the world or made a fortune. Honestly, I've done some bad things in my past. And you know what? That's okay. Because God isn't impressed by my resume. My accomplishments and my accolades don't mean anything to Him. God uses me in all my imperfection for His glory. My name is Andrew, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff. I'm really glad that you guys braved the, the weather to come and be here with us this morning. We're kicking off a brand new series today entitled, Could It Be? Could it be that God could use me? And it's a direct response to our It Takes a Village sermon series, where for four weeks, we investigated not only who we are, why we exist, to be a community where people encounter Jesus and their lives are changed forever, but we looked at what defines us. That at Country Bible Church, we're going to gather, we're going to grow, we're going to give, and we're going to go. And then we spent the last two weeks looking at what drives us, what motivates us, what moves us. And last week, we got to celebrate, we got to intentionally celebrate a mass movement of God throughout our church. And one of the things that we've challenged throughout that entire series is that God is calling each one of us to be a part, an active part of the community of Christ that is Country Bible Church, that we each have a role to play, that God has uniquely called and created us, gifted us with the ability to be a part of something special, a mosaic where individual pieces come together to create a, a, a whole. And this series is a response to, to that because it would absolutely not be a surprise to, to me or, or any of us, really, if we sat back and thought long enough that when you make a challenge, to anybody that God is calling you. God is calling you to be a part of a collective. He's calling you to be a part of something special, something unique, a part of a, a greater design for his purpose. That you begin to do some introspection and you have to ask and answer the question, well, where am I called to serve? What, what can I do? What gifts do I have? What experiences do I have? What qualifications and credentials do I have? And as you do this introspection and you begin to take inventory of all of these different things, it could be that somewhere along the line, you identify at least one, but maybe a multitude of reasons of why God wouldn't want to use you. Maybe you feel you're underqualified. Maybe you're brand new to this entire thing called faith. You're one of the individuals who has just received Jesus as your Lord and Savior the last couple of years. Or maybe, just maybe, you are constantly reminding yourself or you're being reminded all the time of mistakes that you've made in your past that would inhibit or limit your ability to be used by God. But I would argue that the only thing that would inhibit your ability to be used by God is your obedience to God. The only thing that would inhibit you from doing the thing God is calling you to do is simply stepping out in obedience and saying, yes, God, I'm in. I'm all in. And so over the next three weeks together, we're going to look at three stories in Scripture. Three individuals with three very unique stories. How they had to sit back and ask and answer the question, could it be? Could it be that God could use me? And I want to let you know that the answer up front is a resounding yes. And that that's the answer that I hope you will adopt on the heels of this message that God can, not only does God want to, but he will use you in your simple obedience to be a part of something bigger than yourself, much bigger than yourself. Let me encourage you to grab your Bible up front and turn just a little less than halfway in your Bible to the book of Esther. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. And if you don't have a Bible this morning, I would love to invite you to raise your hand and allow one of our ushers to gift you a Bible. These Bibles that they're handing out are a gift. They're yours to have and to keep. We just want you to follow along as we go and bring it with you each week. So if you need a Bible, raise your hand and let's jump in this morning to Esther. We're going to be in verse 1 of chapter 4 as we begin. But as we begin, let me kind of set up, let me establish for us a framework of reference by which we can work. Xerxes is king of a massive province at that time. There's over 127 provinces within his kingdom. 
127 cities, 127 areas in this vast region. He's the most powerful king in the known world at that time. And in his opulence, he wants to celebrate all that he has accomplished. He calls together all of his officials, all of his nobles, and each of the princes in the provinces. He puts together this massive charade, this amazing party where his wealth and opulence is on display. And this goes on for six months. This is a tremendous party that is held outside of his city gates. And there's live performances and music and food and the wine is flowing. In fact, it says Xerxes told his officials to give till each person was filled. That it was, uh, the, the tab was ongoing and it was the king's tab. He was going to pick up the amount. And each person was given a unique gold goblet. Again, demonstrating the opulence of Xerxes. While Xerxes has this party going on, his queen, Vashti, has her own little dinner party going on with her friends. They're hanging out on a separate part of the palace. It occurs to Xerxes as his friends are wealthy with wine that he will bring his wife out on display. So he calls for Vashti. He sends one of his servants to get Vashti. And when Vashti hears what's going on, that the king is requesting your presence, he would like you to come before all of his friends and he would like to put you on display. This is the proverbial trophy wife. She's not having any of it. This is the original uh, women's movements. She tells Xerxes where to stick it. <laughs> Word gets back to Xerxes that, that she's not coming and he has to deal with the multiple aspects of fallout. Not only is his wife telling him no, but the queen is telling him no, and he's the king. There's this power struggle that goes on, and you get the sense that there's this awkward silence Amongst his friends, where they're kind of bouncing and rocking on the heels and toes, and <laughs> Xerxes loses his mind. How dare she defy my order to come and to, to be here? Now, we don't know why she doesn't want to come. Maybe she's just had enough. Maybe he desires that she would disrobe and show all of herself. We don't know. We just know that in this moment, she's decided that she's not going to do it. Uh-uh. Nope. Not your trophy wife. Not going to be put on display. I'm not, I'm not, this is not a local meat market. Yes, I'm telling you. Nope. Not going. Mm-mm. Xerxes goes to his friends, as guys do. And he says, guys, are you, look, what, what do I do? What's happening? And the guys, they look at this very rationally. They begin talking about the consequences. And they say literally, oh, if word gets out about what your wife did, what's that mean for our wives? <laughs> they're, gonna, they're not only going to tell us no, before you know it, they're going to want to vote. We've got to do something. We've got to nip this in the butt right now. Hey, Xerxes, we think what you should do is issue an edict, a decree, a law banishing Vashti from your presence. Don't kill her, but make her live separate from you so she can live out the remainder of her days knowing what she gave up. Yeah, we'll do that. And then we'll set a precedent for women everywhere not to backtalk. Xerxes looks at these guys, didn't give it my study, okay, that's a great idea. And so he issues this law that Vashti can never be brought to his presence again or have a part of his kingdom. He strips her of her authority as queen. Oh, I bet Vashti was just devastated. Sometime later, Xerxes is sitting there <laughs> and reality sets in. I'm without a queen. I'm without a queen. What? what? Ah, my reputation's on the line. Who I marry is a big part of my reputation. What do I do? And so he goes back to his advisors and he says, guys... We've got a problem. We've got a mess to clean up. She backtalked. We made this law. Now I'm without a wife. What do I do? And these guys, typical guy fashion, they get together and they say, you know what we should do, king? Let's hold a beauty contest. Yeah, 
let's send out a law that every single woman in the entire kingdom is brought before the king. They go through the ultimate spa day before they be, they're brought before the king, and then you get to pick and choose. Let's make sure that they do the, the bathing suit, the swimsuit issue. Let's make sure that they show you their talent. Let's ask them some questions and see how they would answer. Let's put them on display so that you can pick and choose amongst all of them the one that you want to be your wife. And, and, and Xerxes is sitting there going, huh, that's brilliant. This is like the ultimate eliminate. I don't have to go through my social media or my apps or, 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 or any of the online dating. I can just have them brought to me. And then I'll pick. So each of his officials goes throughout the region. The regions, the provinces, and they issue this decree, this edict, that all of the virgins are to be brought into the, the king's court. And there they are each assigned a maid, a, someone to help them. And under Hathik, who is one of the king's eunuchs, he gives direction. And each one of these women receives a spa treatment, not for an hour, not for a day or a month, but literally for a year. For 12 months, these women receive beauty treatments, oil and myrrh and perfumes. And, and then at that point, they get to pick and choose amongst the royal wardrobe what they'll wear as they go before the king and present themselves. There's a guy there named Mordecai. And Mordecai's in exile. He's literally a slave. He's been robbed of his home and brought into the kingdom of Xerxes before him, generationally speaking. He's a Jew. And he's got this young cousin that he's adopted as his own. Her name is Esther. Esther's parents had died at some point. When word gets to Mordecai that this, this is happening, that this king wants to bring all the virgins in, he tells Esther, go, but do not divulge your identity. Don't let him know that you are of Jewish descent. And whatever the eunuch suggests, be obedient to that. Be soft-spirited and, and, and be responsive. And so Esther goes and she's included amongst countless women. And she does as the eunuch suggests, as Hathik suggests. And he says, hey, you should wear this and you should go before the king and maybe say this. And Esther does as she's instructed. And so the king finds this incredible favor in Esther and makes her queen, appoints her queen over the kingdom has her as his own, takes her as his wife. Mordecai is at the city gates and he's pacing this once cousin, now dad, who's adopted this young girl into his family, is pacing back and forth and he's asking the, the, the gate guards, how's it going, what's she doing, how, 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 how's she getting along with the king, how's everything going? While he's out the gates working, there are a couple of guys in the kingdom that get upset with Xerxes for whatever the reason is. It doesn't take much to be upset, really, let's be honest. And they find reason to, to be angry with Xerxes, and so they, they plan this assassination attempt. Well, Mor Mordecai hears this, and being a faithful and loyal man, he sends word to Esther about this, this plot to, to kill the king, and she sends word to Xerxes, and Xerxes investigates it, finds out that it's true, and he has these men impaled on poles demonstrating his power and what happens if you cross the king. And at some point, Mordecai's name is recorded as the individual that had tipped off the king to this, this plot. There's a guy named Haman. He's in the inner courts. He's the king's right-hand man. And he's, uh, he's an egalomaniac. The guy's got this, this big ego that precedes him. And as he goes out, he has the king issue this, this law that everybody would bow down to Haman in worship. And so in his pious attitude, he walks outside and as he walks by, people are literally bowing in his presence. The streets are covered with people who bow down before Haman, except Mordecai, who refuses to bow down. Because we know that in Jewish culture, you shall have no other gods before you. And he refused to compromise Haman is furious at what takes place and he comes to this decision that he's got to do something about Mordecai, but not just Mordecai. He's got to do something about a potential uprising. He learns about Mordecai's nationality, that he is Jewish. And what he does is he goes to the king and he says, hey king, there is a people group amongst you. They don't obey your laws. They're off on their own. They do their own thing. They have their own customs, their own traditions, their own celebrations. And they're threatening to overthrow the throne. There's this uprising. 
Xerxes says to Haman, well, I trust you. You're my advisor. What should I do? And he says, how about this? What if you make it a law that one year from now, anyone of Jewish descent can be put to death in this community? Yeah, give them a heads up. Give them a running start. But then let's put some money into the temple treasury and that anybody who kills a Jew will be richly rewarded for their service to the king. And the king taking Haman at his word as his advisor, he he makes this law with his signet ring so that it cannot be revoked by the middies of the Persians. It's, it's this, this old standing long history of, of rules and regulations. And he makes this law that anybody who is Jewish will be put to death. Haman goes out and he finds all the officials and he has them issue this edict in every known language throughout the provinces. 127 provinces. And I just envision when I was a kid growing up in Portland, we had these wood power poles or light poles and as you walk by, there would be these posters stapled of every concert or every event going on. They stapled these posters everywhere about this new decree and that all the Jews are going to be put to death. The community begins to mourn. They begin to wail. The Bible says that they rip their clothes. They put on burlap sacks and they throw ashes, heap ashes upon themselves, which is a sign of mourning. There's great distress and mass confusion in the community. Mordecai hears about this and he goes to the city gate. And as he's at the city gate, he calls to Esther and he says, Esther, this is what's going on, and we're going we're gonna to get into this here in just a minute. But what's about to happen, as we, as we jump into Esther's story, as we put ourselves into this scene, I want us to ask and answer the question, what is Esther's resume? You see, God's about to move through her. God's about to ask her to do something pretty radical. And what we do is we investigate the credentials and the qualifications. Could it be that God could use me? If God asked me to do something radical, could it be that God could use me? Do my credentials matter? Do my qualifications make sense? Am I, am I good enough? So let's, let's just quickly run through what we know of Esther. She's a refugee and a slave. She's an orphan who has been adopted by her cousin because both of her parents have died. She has limited abilities in context because culturally speaking, women... Women were very limited in their roles as women because of their gender. She is brand new to this position as queen. This is a whole new thing to her. She's become comfortable in her confines. She has the whole kingdom in front of her for which she can do with which she pleases. She's not sure. She knows the law, but she's afraid because she's in over her head. And what Mordecai is going to ask her to do is literally... A difference between life and death. It doesn't sound like a very impressive resume for someone that God is going to use to save a nation. This young 20-something-year-old girl, wrong gender, wrong nationality, wrong family background, at what seems to be the wrong time. And yet when God shows up, God can right all wrongs and use you, your qualifications and your credentials, however limited or jacked up they are, to change the face of a nation. Father, I pray as we jump into your word, redeem this time for your glory. Use it for your good that you would be made famous. As I preach now, I pray that my words would be integrous and intentional as an act of obedience to you. Lord, where my heart is heavy right now, I simply surrender it to you. And I ask that you would work in spite of me, all for your glory. Amen. I'm going to read Esther chapter 4, and I'm going to begin in verse 1. The verses that will come up on the screen here in a minute are going to begin in verse 13. But I would hope that all of you would have a Bible, and you would have your Bible open to Esther chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. When Mordecai learned about all that had been done, in other words, that Haman had allowed this decree to happen with the king's authority to kill all Jews, he tore his clothes and he put on burlap and ashes, and he went out into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail. 
He went as far as the gate of the palace, for no one was allowed to enter the palace gate while wearing clothes of mourning. And as news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, there was great mourning among the Jews. They fasted, wept, and wailed, and many people lay in burlap and ashes. What we should get from these three verses is that there is a funeral procession going on. They are not hungry, they are not happy, they are not healthy, emotionally, there is nothing but distress. Their lives are on the line. Verse 4 says, When Queen Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, her cousin, now father, post-adoption, she was deeply distressed, and she sent clothing to him. Why? Because when people in our lives are suffering, we long to comfort them. This is a natural response. She sent clothing to him, not knowing why he was upset. She sent clothing to him to replace the burlap, but he refused it. Then Esther sent for Hathik, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed as her attendant, and she ordered him to go to Mordecai and find out what was troubling him and why he was in mourning. So Hathik went out to Mordecai in the square, in front of the palace gate, in front of everyone. And verse 7 says, Mordecai told him the whole story, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai gave Hathik a copy of the decree. He ripped one off of the light pole, and he said, here, see for yourself issued in Susa that called for the death of all Jews. And he asked Hathik to show it to Esther and explain the whole situation to her. He also asked Hathik to direct her to go to the king, to beg for mercy and to plead for her people. So Hathik returned to Esther with Mordecai's message. He was just the, the middleman, and he has got the responsibility of relaying not only the message, but the emotion and the, the distress behind this. In verse 10, Esther told Hathik to go back and relay this message to Mordecai. You see, now she's looked at her resume. Now she's considered her credentials and her qualifications and the potential ramifications if she allows this to happen. After looking at everything, she says, go back and tell Mordecai all the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know. In other words, everybody everywhere knows that anyone, anyone, whether you're the king's wife or someone he's never met who appears before King Xerxes in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless, caveat, the king holds out his gold scepter. And the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days. So Hathak gave Esther's message to Mordecai. She's looking at the set of circumstances in front of her, and she's trying to rationalize with Mordecai. She's explaining to him why she is underqualified and overwhelmed. I'm brand new to this position. I'm a Jew in hiding. He doesn't even know my nationality. I'm young. I'm female. I haven't been called before the king. And if I go, even the, even the, the pastor buyers in this community know that if I go before the king without being invited into his inner circle, I'm going to lose my life. This is literally, you're asking me to go and die for the king. Jesus will spend his entire teaching ministry asking us to die to self for the glory of the king. And we will see example after example after example of people who over-examinate the credentials and qualifications and walk away in absolute disobedience because they're overwhelmed and underqualified. Word gets back to Mordecai. And in verse 13, Mordecai sent his reply to Esther. Don't think, don't even think for a moment that just because you're in the palace, that you will escape when all other Jews are killed. For if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise. It's a promise, it's a guarantee from the God of our forefathers who has promised in covenant to Abraham, he's promised in covenant to Isaac, he's promised in covenant to Jacob that relief will arise. And don't think that if you're disobedient and and you don't act that, that you are going to be spared your life. And don't think that God won't use another set of circumstances or individuals for, for some place. But you and your relatives will die too. Who knows, Esther, who knows if perhaps you, you were made queen for just such a time as this. And I have to ask you, who knows if God doesn't have you at Country Bible Church this moment in this season for a reason. 
That you're here on purpose, with a purpose, and for his purpose. And all God is waiting on is you to receive that purpose and respond in a simple act of obedience. Who knows? We celebrated last week all that God has done, and I truly believe that it is an act of obedience that has led to that. Nothing that I have done. I think it's been an act of obedience on my part and my family's part, but also on our staff and our elders and many of you. And so here's my question for us to consider is, who knows if you step up and are obedient to what God is calling you to use your time, your treasure, and your talents in this village for this season and this time, what God might do through you. Who knows? Who knows? So then Esther sent this reply in verse 15 to Mordecai. Go. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And my maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go to see the king. And if I must die, I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything that Esther had ordered him to do. And I wonder what would happen, how if that was the cry of our hearts, that if I must die, I must die. As a simple act of obedience to honor God and advance his kingdom, what he could do through us. Make no mistake about it, God is asking you to die. And I know this isn't the pep talk you were hoping for as you woke up this morning and saw the snow and made your way to church anyway. Well, a preacher's going to tell me today that I'm called to die. But you are called to die. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, if any of you wants to be my disciple, if you want to follow me, take up your cross, deny yourself. In other words, die to yourself daily and follow me. Paul will go on to say, anybody who wants to save his life will lose it. And anybody who is willing to lose their life will save it. In order for us to be completely obedient and fully surrendered to what God is calling us to, his word, his will, and his way, it requires that we die to ourselves, that we die to our intentions, that we die to our best laid plans, that we die to our will so that we can focus on his way. There is no other way. John 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What good is it if you gain the whole world but forfeit your soul? Scripture teaches us that that is death in and of itself. So, so what if you're opulent here on earth? So what if you've got houses, plural? So what if you've got vehicles, plural? So what if you've got bank accounts, plural? So what if you've got everything you think you've wanted in life figured out? Let me ask you this question. What, what are you taking with you? Make no mistake, to advance the kingdom of God, he is asking you to die to self. And when you look at Esther's resume, it's really quite underwhelming. And when you look at yourself, it's probably quite underwhelming as well as overwhelming when you consider what God might be calling you to do. How does he want me to serve in the church? Is it the kids' ministry? Is it going to this men's conference? Is it serving in the women's ministry? Is it helping greet at the doors? Is it shoveling snow? Perhaps it's leading a life group. Maybe it's a part of the tech team or the worship team. Perhaps it's helping on Awanas or Wednesday night youth group. I, I don't know, but I do know that God is calling each and every one of us to step up and to step out in this season. Could it be that God could use me? The answer is absolutely yes. The answer is in the question that you have to ask. Will you let God use you? So Esther sends this word back to Mordecai. Mordecai, in kind, is obedient. He goes to all of his friends in the community and he gives them this decree that Esther has issued. Pray fast. Don't eat a drink. Three days and I'm going to do the same. As they're doing this, Esther devises a plan that is going to include a couple of parties and some intentional invitations. That night, Xerxes is lying in bed and he can't sleep. This is before melatonin was a thing. My wife tried to explain to me that you can have as much melatonin as you like because it's all natural. And so she stirs it into my dinner here. She just keeps going like, oh, 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 here. I have some porridge, my pretty. Her plot is that if I can fall asleep, she can get something done. I'm on to her. And they make these melatonin taste like gummy bears. My kids are like, oh, I'm so, I'm so, I, I can't fall asleep without melatonin. Look at how hyper I am. Look at how hyper I am. Can I have a melatonin? And then all of a sudden they're tired. It's a placebo. Xerxes is laying in bed and he can't sleep. 
So you know what he does? Guys, guys, lean into this for just a minute. Imagine this. Riddle me this, Riddler. You can't sleep. What do you do? Oh, you lay in bed and you call to your wife to come sit by your bedside and read a chronicles of all of the amazing things that you have accomplished. <laughs> that doesn't sound bad to me. He calls for the chronicles to be read. A history of his kingdom and what he's accomplished. And as they're reciting this to Xerxes, as he's kicked back, feet up in bed, listening to all of his accolades, all that he's accomplished, something catches his attention. He's heard it before. But now in this moment, it catches his attention. It said, and Mordecai spared the king's life in that he uncovered a plot to kill the king. And the king shot out of bed and he said, hey, what, what did I ever do for the man that saved my life? And they looked and they said, well, there's nothing here, king. You didn't do anything. Just then, Haman, the king's trusted advisor, Haman, the egalomaniac, Haman, the one who created law that says, you'll bow down and worship me, knocks on the door and he comes in and the king says, hey, Haman, I'm so glad you're here. Hey, let me ask you a question. What should be done for the man who, who, who did more for the king than anybody else, who spared the king's life? And Haman, in his haste and his arrogance, he thinks to himself, Surely the king is talking about me. Who else would he talk about? And if this is, if this is uh, circa 1986, 87, uh, WWF, this is a Ric Flair moment where he's walking around. Woo! <laughs> he's talking about me. And so he comes up with this amazing, hey, king, you know what you should do? Get one of your royal horses that has your brand right on the side of it. Yeah, one that you've ridden. And, and get a royal robe that you've worn. And get your signet ring, one that, 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 that is on this, that's opulent on display for everybody. And then put your crown on that person. Put him on the horse and, and have a whole parade of people lead that man through the city so that everybody can admire him. And the king says, yes, that's a great idea. Go get it. Mordecai. Do you see the confusion as Haman is now responsible to go get the man that he hates? That he has literally put a decree out to kill all of his people because of the bitterness inside of him. I wonder how much the bitterness inside of us keeps us from the better side of what God wants us to do. And so he goes out there and Haman has to help Mordecai up on the horse. And Haman has to drape this floral robe over him and put the ring on him. And he leads him through the streets. He gets back. And needless to say, he is mad. And he goes home to his wife and he says, this is ridiculous. What should I do? And they said, hey, how about this? Build a gallows. Yeah, build a sharp pole 75 feet high that you're going to throw Mordecai's body on. Impale him in front of everybody. And Haman says, woman, that's a good idea. So they build this gallows. The next day, Mordecai comes to work. Esther comes before the king, knowing that she could lose her life. She knocks on the door, and he's sitting in his throne. And as she comes forward, she kneels down in respect. And he does, he does. He extends the gold scepter, sparing her life. And he says, Esther, what is it? What can I do for you? Anything up to half the kingdom. Ask, and it's yours. And Esther, she's a smart woman. Guys, we can learn, guys, we can learn a lot from how the ladies in our lives go about things. She's not irrational. She doesn't just go before and say, well, let me tell you what your friend Haman did. Let me tell you, he just did this and he's trying to kill them. He's like, <laughs> she says, hey, if it's okay with you, can, I'm throwing a party tonight. Would you come and, and, and would you bring Haman with you? So the king says, sure, let's go. They go to this party and while they're there, the king says, Typical husband fashion. All right, what is it you really want? I know you brought me here for a reason. What is it? Up to half of the kingdom, Esther, and it's yours. And she says, I know, but do me this favor. If it pleases the king, let me throw one more party. Would you come back tomorrow night and bring Haman with you again? I'd just love to have this party. Sure, Esther. So Haman goes home that night, and he sees Mordecai. And he's got this disdain in his heart as he walks out and everybody's bowing to him except Mordecai. But he goes home and he says, I can't even enjoy, I can't even enjoy this party because of this man. But did you know that I'm the only one of all the king's officials who was invited to this party, not once, but twice? Yeah, I'm pretty amazing. The party happens the next day and they're getting their celebration on. King Xerxes looks at Esther and he says, my queen, come on, why are we doing this? What is it you really want? 
Name it, up to half the kingdom, it's yours. And she says, my king, all I ask of you is that you spare my life from the man who is set out to destroy it. And Xerxes says, what are you talking about? Who would do such a thing? Nobody dare mess with my queen. Are you kidding me? He bows up. He gets real thick, real big, real quick. And he says, who did this? And Esther says, it was Haman. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. That pig of a man sitting right next to you. Yeah, you Haman. And Haman, in his gold goblet, wine drinking face, goes, spits wine out everywhere. And he says, well, I'm not trying to kill you. She says, oh, but you are because I'm a Jew. And in that moment, King Xerxes, it says he goes out to his garden and he counts to 10. He took some anger management classes. <laughs> he, he walks out there and he's, he's, it says he's pacing the garden. And as he's pacing the garden, Haman is on his face bowing before the queen, begging for his life. And get this irony. I love this. I love this. It's sadistic, but I love it. As the king comes back in from the garden and up to deal with the situation, he opens the door and he sees Haman on his face at the queen's knee knees. And you know what he says? He says, is it not enough you're trying to kill her? You're going to seduce her before you do it? (laughs) And his guards take a black bag and they cover his face, representing his imminent doom. And there on the gallows that Haman had built for Mordecai's body, he'll lose his life. Not just Haman, but his entire family. And so the story goes that Mordecai is brought in and he's elevated to the position of Haman, and then he'll go on to be second in command over the entire kingdom. And all this because a simple slave girl orphan who was underqualified and overwhelmed had to ask and answer the question, could it be that God could use me? And in her simple obedience, God saved the nation. I want to look at three lessons that I wrote down that I want to share with you about Esther's story. The first thing that we need to identify is that Esther was afraid. She was afraid. And so she sent back to Mordecai. Everybody knows that if you go to the king without acceptance or invitation, you're going to die. And so she was afraid. How many of us know that God's calling us to something significant, but we're afraid? We are afraid of reputation. We are afraid of relationships. We're afraid of uh, the time commitment. We're afraid of the resources. We're afraid. We're, we're just, we are afraid that we don't know how to do it. We're afraid that we're so brand new to this thing called faith or so brand new to this church or we live in a small community where everybody talks about everything and we're just afraid. I want to talk about fear for a moment. Here's what I wrote down. While Esther was afraid, faith Faith isn't the absence of fear. Faith isn't the absence of fear. Instead, faith is trusting and obeying God in the moments that don't make sense. Faith isn't the absence of fear. Faith is trusting and obeying God in the moments that don't make sense. In Hebrews 11.1, it says, faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. There's no confidence in the things of the world. Faith is confidence in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, we walk by faith, not by sight. What was in front of Esther, at least to the mind's eye, what she could see was imminent danger and death, and she was afraid. But as she stepped out in faith, God honored her simple obedience. I would argue that it's not Most of us, we've heard this song, fear is a liar. But your feelings are still your feelings. And so that song kind of does a little bit of a disservice. It's completely true theologically. Fear is a liar. God didn't create us to be afraid of anything. Scripture says that we were created with a courageous spirit, not one of timidity, but one of love and courage and sound mind. So anything opposed to that is, is not of God. But I would argue that God identifies our feelings They're natural. They're wrong in that it shouldn't control you and keep you from God's calling, but but they're natural. So what do you do then in the face of fear? Well, you identify that faith is greater than fear. You ask and answer the question and you say, faith isn't the absence of fear, it's trusting and obeying God in the moments that don't make sense. The second thing 
about Esther's circumstances that seemed insurmountable. You look at everything she had in front of her and they seemed insurmountable. She had all the reasons why she couldn't do what was asked of her. And here's what I wrote down. The second lesson that I want us to learn from this is rather than getting caught up in all of your limitations, remind your circumstance of God's reputation. Instead of getting caught up in all of your limitations, all the reasons why you can't do what God's calling you to do, remind your circumstance of God's reputation. And he says, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. I am the God who's done it, and I am the God who will do it again. I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. I am the bookends, who was, who is, who is to come. The same power and authority that lived on earth through Jesus is alive now in you. The same power that conquered the grave is active in you. And he says, when your circumstances are overwhelming, remind your circumstance of my reputation. It may look bleak, but in the midst of, of these moments of distress and fear, you have the ability to stand face to face with yourself in the mirror and speak into your situation, and you speak into your situation the reputation of God. Not all the reasons you can't do why God's calling you to do what he wants you to do, but you speak into the reputation of God. Moses in Exodus 3 says, I, I, I can't go. I'm, I'm, I'm a murderer and I have a, a speech impediment and, and I've lost everything. And if I go before Pharaoh, he's going to kill me. Well, what do I do? Who do I tell him to send me? And he says, you tell him I am that I am. I am the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I have done it in them and I will do it in you. You speak God's reputation into your circumstance. In other words, don't let your circumstance tell you how big it is. It is, you remind your circumstance how big your God is. All too often we're concerned with how big our problem in our lives are. It's not enough, <laughs> it's not often enough that we make sure our circumstance knows how big our God is. And the third lesson that I want us to pull from this is that Esther didn't do anything wrong. She was just afraid of not doing anything. I'm sorry, Esther was afraid to do nothing. Esther didn't do anything wrong. She was just afraid to do anything. And I wrote this down. While religion draws our efforts toward sins of commission, in other words, what we commit, things that we do wrong, sins of omission equally trouble the heart of God. In other words, knowing what God's calling you to do and not acting. These sins of omission are critical, they're dangerous, and they're deadly. So the question this morning on the table is twofold. The question on the table and for this series is, could it be that God could use me could it be that God could use me? And that answer is a resounding yes. Despite your resume and your circumstances, God absolutely can use you. Which leads to our second question of the morning. What is your for such a time as this right now? What is your for such a time as this right now? Mordecai says to Queen Esther, don't get it mistaken. Don't think you're gonna save your life when the king finds out that you're a Jew. His law cannot be revoked. It was set in place by the, the laws of the Midis and the Persians. He can't do anything to change the outcome. So when they find out you're a Jew, don't think just because you're the queen, you're gonna live. You're not, you're gonna die. And salvation is going to come from somewhere else because God's a faithful God. He's a God of his promises, his covenants. But who knows that you became Queen Esther for such a time as this. And so my simple question to you this morning is, what is your for such a time as this moment that God is calling you to respond to right now? Does, what, does God want to use your story to recreate history here at Country Bible Church? Yes, he does. Does God want to use your story? Regardless of how 
broken or perfect you've got it? Yes, he does. Those aren't questions. The question is, will you step out of faith and in simple obedience and allow God to use you for such a time as this?